you tend to train now you could correct me if i'm wrong but anywhere in the neighborhood of maybe five to six days per week is that is that right uh, pretty accurate for the most part of the year i mean yeah i can't remember the last time i didn't train six days a week and okay. i don't know if you count am and pm sessions but for a long time i split my training into two so you can even say i was in like double <laughs> figures at some points <laughs> yeah and and so in that regard because you've been doing that consistently for quite a while like in and, and it seems to be working really well for you so if someone was thinking about it where might it apply for someone and how, what do they need to really um prior uh, adjust in terms of those variables sure. to make it appropriate for the most part and i know it you know it's going to be generalized guidelines, but maybe you can elaborate. Sure. So yeah, I would say two a day training. First of all, I wouldn't say anyone needs it. I, I'm not mm. sure actually many top competitors use it, um, okay. but I think it is somewhat related to that potentially like go hard or go home. Uh, I think it's also a bit of a newer concept, kind of like reps in reserve. It, it's just a newer kind of, people might've done something like that in the past. Like I know people have quoted Jay Cutler saying, He's never taken a set to failure or something along those lines. Like he just, he, that's not how he trained. And so maybe they applied it in the past, but there was no name for it. I think maybe in the golden era, they did AM and PM maybe. Like I think I, I remember someone saying Arnold would train like twice a day or whatever. He was a big on volume or whatever. Yes. So I think um, the reason maybe we don't see it so much is people aren't kind of there and at it. And it's the same with why maybe you don't get many at the top now doing six days a week. I don't even, I don't know necessarily what they're doing, but. Maybe they're not doing it because of what they're currently practicing doesn't allow for it. But maybe in 10 years time, we'll see more and more people adopting these strategies because like, as you learn how to do things potentially better, and I think there are potential benefits to doing it. Obviously, I wouldn't be doing it otherwise. They get more and more common practice. It's kind of like when flexible dieting first came out and people were talking about if it fits your macros, whatever. I think there wasn't that many people doing it. Uh, and slowly people learn, oh, that's what it means. It's kind of like, ah, oh, like the science makes sense. It's got principles and that sort of thing. And now it's like common practice. Like you'll get mm. IFBB pros like doing flexible dieting. I don't think you would have got that a decade ago. So I think some of these things, maybe you're not seeing it as much because it's just, we're learning all the time about what's driving hypertrophy. How do we best kind of set up our programming to allow for that? So I, I would still say no one needs it necessarily, but it can be beneficial for a select number of people. So one could be just that person that has a preference for it. So they like training multiple times a day and it fits their lifestyle. Maybe they're a PT and they're in the gym anyway. So it's like, maybe it's a case of they have an hour break and that's not quite enough time to really, and they have to rush their session a little bit. And so by splitting up, maybe their upper body session, they can do their back and chest. And then later they can do their arms and delts. Awesome. Like for that person, it, it suits their lifestyle, it suits their preferences. Um, for someone where it's not like a preference-based thing and it's not a... I guess, lifestyle-based thing. It's more of a, do I actually need this? Will I actually benefit from this? They certainly want to be already training like five or six times a week, I think, because mm. I see tour days as like a component of frequency. Because that's essentially what we're doing. We're just spreading out volume and it's more of an advanced tool. So when you're an advanced lifter, it's whether or not you need more volume. You're probably at the higher end of the volume you would have needed in your training career, but also that volume is more fatiguing for you because you're stronger, things like this. So it tends to make sense to split it up more. When you're a novice, three full body sessions, hey, you're going to be growing. But as you get more and more advanced, you want to start splitting it to like upper lower four times a week. And then maybe you go push pull legs, upper lower five times a week. And then maybe you can get to like a push pull legs, push pull legs, or however you want to split up your volume, kind of split to kind of here or there, I, I kind of think about training that muscle enough within a session to stimulate growth and then training it again once it's recovered rather than necessarily a split. But these are splits people know of and that they work very well fundamentally. So I don't think you really want to come to like, if you're doing three full body sessions a day, rather than going to like AM and PM, go to like four days, like you'll get more recovery from a full night's sleep than you will from like three hours and a meal. <laughs> so you're right. going to get better training if you can split it up that way. There might be some people that are training four days a week and they just can't. Again, that's more lifestyle preference based. So if I just consider someone as like who can train as many days as you ever could want on paper, like they're just this perfect person. It's a case of during your upper body session, and you can probably talk to this, Kenny, like if you're doing chest, you're doing back, you're doing delts, you're doing tricep, biceps, like everything, like it adds up. By the end of the session, how much due diligence are you giving to whatever's last? Maybe not that much. 
And maybe it could grow better if you separated your session and you could have a meal, you could chill out a little bit, come back in. And now it's like, wow, like that's, you're probably going to get much higher quality of volume. So I wouldn't look in, like you said, like you just took your current volume, you split it in two. Great. You'll get the individuals who will be like, okay, cool. I'm going to do upper in the morning, lower in the <laughs> evening. And I'm going to do that every day. It's like, no, you'll run into a wall very, very quickly. You kind of want to take the current volume you're doing, and just split it up. You might find your, you can tolerate a little bit more volume, or you might find actually the quality is so high that the kind of the stimulus you're getting from that volume is absolutely fine. And you can kind of do that. So it definitely it generally wants to come from a need versus a want. And some things people want to avoid doing is, well, nutrient timing becomes more important in this scenario. It's become, I would say, in the evidence-based space, fairly well known that we don't have to be obsessive about whacking down a protein shake and like dextrose post-workout because insulin and the post-workout window is more of a barn door. Maybe you want to get a meal in within an hour post-workout, but it doesn't have to be like high GI carbohydrates and whey protein. It can be like a mixed meal if you want it to because you're not training later in the day, you're training like the next day and it's probably a different muscle group anyway. So we don't have to worry so much. But if you train chest in, chest in the morning, you've got triceps in the evening, your triceps are trained during chest. They're a bit fatigued. If you actually want to get the most from your triceps now, you do want to recover as soon as possible. So you do want a faster digesting meal to replenish glycogen to come in as well fueled as possible. So those details, because if you're going to do it, why not do it right? Kind of make sure your nutrient timing set up correctly. And it doesn't have to be like a span of three to four hours, whatever. It could be eight hours. It could be four hours within the same day. Even if you took half an hour within a session, say you have two hours to train, but your session only would take an hour and a half or something. Take half an hour in the middle of your session, have an intra workout shake during your session, mm. hydrate, chill out a little bit. You could come and finish the PM stuff. I've done that before when I can't get back into the gym later. And I'm like, I still want to get some of the benefits of the PM training. And I have time now. So I'll do that sometimes even. Um, and then the other thing you want to avoid in terms of training, generally, you don't want to train anything in the kind of the AM or the first portion of the session that's going to impact the later session. So for, in the example I use with chest and triceps, if you train your triceps in the morning, and then you go to train chest later, your triceps are probably going to be the limiting factor in all your chest works. So you're not going to get a good chest workout. Whereas the other way around, sure, your triceps are going to get a bit tired during chest training, but you've hit your chest chest really well, a little bit of triceps. And then in the evening, you now isolate the triceps. So they get a great workout. So you also wouldn't want to do something like leg curls or like leg extensions in the morning, and then come back and do your like compound leg work. Cause it's like, you've just damaged or even the other way around. If you've trained a muscle group, you kind of want to finish training in that muscle group there and then, and then let it start kind of recovering, adapting. You don't want to kind of do like half your chest work in the morning and half in the evening. I, I don't think that's probably the best way to set things up. We don't have tons of literature on this, by the way. I, I know um, Eric Helms just released a podcast, I think, with... Um, oh, my, on, yeah, I saw that. On iron culture, yes. yes. So I haven't I listened that. to it all, but the evidence that we have seems to be kind of... There's not much, especially specifically for bodybuilding. And I know those guys are like, it's not a game changer of a thing to do. You definitely don't have to do it. But there could be some scenarios where there's some promising like lines of evidence that is showing benefit. And I think theoretically, you can think about it and be like, I could see how that could benefit things. At the time, I thought I was training to failure. The more I think about it, I, I do think there's a level of like skill acquisition to properly, form, like it's hard to say properly training to failure, but I think I failed, but not because my muscles necessarily were absolutely failing, but it was like, I don't know, technique just broke down or because I wasn't performing it properly or I didn't have my breathing right. 